morning. Good morning. Okay. Glad to have you. Glad to be here. Uh, all you people that are on Facebook, glad to have you with us too. Look forward to the day when we don't, though. And I'm glad to have, maybe it's, you know, a lot of congregations, it's locked in. It's going to be that way for, from then on, you know. But uh, there's something in the fellowship that uh, makes me not want to have that. Uh, maybe it's old school, right? I don't know why I can say anything about old school. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I'm about tired of the news. I'm about tired of the pandemic. I'm about tired of everything that I have to go through and being part of the school system and the pandemic. You teachers can smile or not, but keeping masks on middle school kids. Wow. Okay. They like to wear them around their chin right here. So I think, though, as, as we consider these things and the, and the world that we're actually living in today, great to see you. And I got to stay behind this. In the world we live in today, do we hold any responsibility ourselves as Christians for the world the way it is today? Think it. You know, I have three sons. They incarnate me. If you were to talk to each one of them, you would get something from them, if you knew me, that would remind you of me. It's scary sometimes. It's even scary for them. In fact, this one that's here today told me that his older brother, Tim, when he calls, he sounds just like me on the phone. Well, I, don't, I never did like my own voice very much, and it's, I've got a little mucus going on. That's why it's kind of squeaky today. But we do this incarnating thing. Years from now, and maybe even today, they'll use some of them old cliches about the chip off the old block, the acorn doesn't fall from the tree. They are their father's sons. And some of you are probably thinking, I feel sorry for those kids. But I take pride in it. I love each and every one of their differences. In fact, I got one now that's in that great throng that's up there waiting and cheering us on. Something else, man. No, I have three sons, well and alive and living today. People who have never met me will be able to tell much about who I was by looking at my sons. For though they will be themselves, in many and profound ways, they'll be also like me. Now I want us to kind of shift just a little bit here because I want us to take a look at a word that should mean a lot to us. In fact, I'd rather have that sign up there that was we had for communion than the one we got now, but that's okay. I don't know if I can talk them into it or not. <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> okay. This word incarnation, the derivatives of that, you know, like carnal, pertaining to the body of flesh. Carnation used to be a, a flesh-colored flower. Now they come in all kinds of colors, don't they? Carnival, the festival appealing to the flesh, originally a part of uh, a party thrown just before Lent. So we can just go do the stuff we're going to try to stop doing during Lent, all right? Carnivore a flesh-eating animal, but incarnation. An investment with a, uh, and, and to invest with a body to be the embodiment of incarnation. Jesus is the incarnation of God, amen? You've studied that, you've got verses, I'm gonna give you some more, because always when the faithful say amen, that means there's a bunch of people out there that are probably, what? I don't know about that. Jesus of Nazareth was a human being. He ate, he slept, he went to the bathroom, he worked with his hands, he felt fatigue, and he knew pain. Yet Christians believe that Jesus was more than human. He was God in the flesh. God in the flesh and human being. The prophets announced him that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. 
One passage says he tabernacled with us, made his tent with us, lived among us, was one of us. He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. He knows about us. He's been here, been through that. He can really empathize. And he's still alive. Matthew and Luke testify that Jesus was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, in a quite literal sense. Our belief is that in Jesus, God became flesh and wrapped himself in human form and lived among us as a man. As a man. Totally as a man. That belief is foundational to Christianity. Christian dumb, as we like to say. It's about it. It's common across the board. Some of the early heresies to threaten the church rejected the incarnational understanding of Jesus. The Docetic and the, uh, pardon me with the names here, Unitarian and Montanus and Arians. Some of the earliest creeds of Christendom offered belief in the con con incarnation as a basis to the Christian faith. The Nicene Creed in, in what, 325. Listen to this quote from that creed. We believe in the one Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father, that is the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God. My Lord himself understood that he was God in the flesh. We won't read all the verses, but in John 14, 5 through 11, it's talked about there. He had no hesitation in making bold act assertions regarding his nature. I am, I am the father of one. He who sees me sees the father who sent me. John 12, 45. And then in John 10, 38, the father is in me and I'm in the father. When you were looking at Jesus, you were looking at God. Everything about him was the father. His entire in his entire gospel, John tells us, is written from an incarnational perspective. That apostle believed 100% that his God came walking and talking in the flesh. John marvels in his first letter, 1 John, what was from the beginning, the word of life. He had seen with his hands and his he had seen with his eyes and his hands had touched. Now the passage that we're reading here, let's go back over to Hebrews. We had it in the communion this morning, but I want to look at in chapter 1 there. God, after he'd spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets and the many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is, the he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. Exactly. We get the word icon from that exactly a representation of his nature there. Snapshot. Bam. There goes God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God in the flesh. God there. God real. Incarnation. People who who Jesus knew well, and people who know Jesus well understand that he claims to be the spitting image of his Father. He personifies God, personifies God. Well, where are you going? Did you know we are the second incarnation? Think about it. Really? Really? Is that what we're living today? If Christendom takes this serious, we hold a lot of power in this world, in our own country, in our own cities, in our own towns, to change the direction things are going. If we believe that we are the second incarnation, when people see us, they see the Lord. That's who we are. We are his children. We got passages upon passages. The church is made up of human beings, all shapes, sizes, 
A lot of times weak, struggling, harried people, yet the church is more than human. We also are the incarnation of God, given the power to do so by his spirit that indwells us. When we were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, that wasn't just a warm spot for the Spirit to live. Because the Spirit does the empowering. Well, Will, I can't be like Jesus. Got it. And God knew it. And so he says, I'll put the Spirit within you that allows you to have that power to be like Him in any circumstance we find ourselves. But the media and the world beats on us so much that we end up believing them. That we're just weak and here we are and we don't know what's going on in our, our country and in the pandemic and, 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 and God says, you are my empowerment. You are me in the world today. Amen. You're me. And if he's for us, what? We are all being transformed into his image and collectively radiate the glory for all the world to see. We in this room today, we are on Facebook today. We are what they see when they're looking for God. We have to be a people that have the answers, not people who live with big question marks floating around over us all the time. We have to be able to allow him to work through us. You and your individual family situations and so on. It looks insurmountable. It's overrolling me. Plus everything else that's going on. If we keep acting like that, it will overroll us. And we'll crumble like the world crumbles around us. Instead of, I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. This belief is also foundational to Christianity. Many Christians who would never for a moment doubt that Jesus is God in the flesh have no understanding that the church is Jesus wrapped in the fleshly covering of our feeble selves. I think I can still illustrate it this way. It's been a long time, but I'll give it a try. It's a pocket knife I carry. Really, do I need a pocket knife? Not really. Dad did, so I did. Who did? My dad. See, I incarnate him too. But when the world looks at us, we think this is what they see. That's just us hanging out there. There we are. We're not any different than any other pocket knives laying around or any different than anything else. But here we are in Christ. Here we are, saved in him, empowered by his spirit. We are his strength, his hope in the world. And I don't know about you, but that fight excites me. I love being on the right team, all right? Stare at me now. In John 1, 12 and 13, it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right, they didn't become automatically, notice that. To them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Who are we born of? God. For his children in him, with his strength. Who are these people who are born of God? In the same passage and with the same language, John described the incarnation of God through Jesus. He also described the incarnation of God through those who believe, and that's us. Amen, we believe? You bet. Luke 10, 16. The one who listens to you listens to me, says Jesus. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. So when they're listening to you, they're listening to Jesus. If they reject you, they reject Jesus. If they reject you and Jesus, guess who else is there? They reject God. We have some responsibility to live the way God wants us to live. Even when it hurts and even when it's not, does that mean we walk around with a a smile plastered on our face. No, but we also don't get driven in the dirt by everything that comes along. 
Send, let me give you some setting on, on, on that verse that he just said. Sending out the 72, one of the earliest instances of the church, notice the parallel. To reject Jesus is to reject the one who sent him. Implied is the notion that Jesus and God are so intimately connected that your reaction to the one determines your reaction to the other. Jesus insists that the same relationships exist between his disciples and himself. He says to reject those who witness to Christ is to reject Christ himself. To receive the one is to receive the other also. Now, if you let your minds go, or if you want to turn there over to Acts 9, the guys are doing a great job with the book of Acts on Sunday morning. The setting, Saul's breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Make no mistake, if you read all the, the, the times when Paul goes into that, I think there's three of them, when he tells about his story on the road to Damascus, he was killing them, okay? He wasn't just putting them into prison. He was a murderer. Could God use him? Like I said in Bible class, it says, pray for your enemies, don't shoot them. If they shoot you, what? Hallelujah anyway. If we shoot them, what? They may, may just have taken their life away really well. So the setting is he's breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And then he's on the road to Damascus, and we think he was on a horse, and bam, the light comes, blinds him, knocks him down. Everybody hears something. But what he hears is, why are you persecuting the church? No. Why are you persecuting me? Because when the church is persecuted, who's persecuted? Christ. Because the church is Christ in the flesh. We're the second incarnation, all right? When Saul arrests, when Saul arrests and imprisoned and puts to death those who are being, going to the way, he's persecuting Jesus himself. You remember when, who was it? Uh, Peter and John? Aren't those the ones that got whipped and went on their way rejoicing? I may have got my guys mixed up a little bit there, but did they go away saying, what more could we do for the Lord than what we've done? And that they did this to us. We can hardly move. No. Oh, jailer, do you love Jesus? How do we feel when things get rough for us? I'm going to trust you anyway, Lord. I don't see the end. I don't see how to, it's going to come out the other side. I don't know how it's going to work. I just know I'm yours. I may not have all the, figured out all the doctrine and all the stuff, but I'm yours. Paul clearly took this lesson to heart for much of his language describing the church is incarnational language. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things objection under his feet and gave him as him gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all, which is his body. Which is his body. The second incarnation. Let me read you a quote from a book that I read. This happened to be the book was called The Second Incarnation, all right. Just as he was God incarnate in a physical body as Jesus of Nazareth, so is he now God incarnate in a spiritual body as the church. When that church is healthy and engaged in its proper work, it becomes Christ's very presence in the world. It carries on what he started among us. It is the grand finale to his ministry and is his chosen vehicle for living in the world in fullness rather than in mere memory. Jesus is not something that happened a long time ago, and the only time I really think of him is do this in remembrance of me. His spirit loves each of us. We are his body. They see him through us. The church is Jesus wrapped in the fleshly covering of our own selves and empowered by his spirit 
And that means something quite extraordinary. When we understand the church properly, we cannot think of ourselves primarily in terms of structure and creeds and activities and traditions. The church exists rather to be the exact image of its master. We embody Christ's character and essence. We are Jesus' people in the truest sense of the term. Whatever forms the church uses to assemble, whatever we think about the way we're assembling right now, whatever programs it adopts for ministry, make sure we get those right, you know, that's, whatever ones that we adopt for ministry, whatever means it uses to express a sense of fellowship, the result must be something so Christ-like, so reflective of his character, so inca incarnational, that it becomes possible for the world to recognize Jesus in us. All they got to do is walk through the door. Jesus is there. He's there. I think of some men in my life, there's been a couple, I, I have a list of grand elders, okay? And they usually were elders. This one fellow wasn't. His name's Bert Nickel. And it was when I was preaching in Ridgecrest, and I preached out there for 12 years. Sometimes I would see Bert looking at me, and I'd look back, and we wouldn't have to say a word. He'd come through the door, shaking hands, like is our custom with the preacher, okay? He said, did you feel it? Didn't happen every Sunday. Didn't happen all the time. Bird said he was there today, wasn't he? He said, I knew you knew it. That's happened with a few people in my life and other congregations and other places. There's just something about it. But the one way, I believe this with all my heart, that we can guarantee this, and it will change all of us from the inside out, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Over and over and over and over and over. Keep reading them. Keep looking at them. Keep praying about the words in there. The Gospels. And you see, Paul wouldn't have much to talk about if Jesus hadn't already taken care of it, would he? Now, I believe Paul's inspired. I got all of that. But sometimes we really hurry through those Gospels to get to whatever Paul has to say. When it's what Jesus not only accomplish, but what he is accomplishing through us today that makes the difference. March L.B. have been married 60 years. Same woman. <laughs> Man, do I love her. We're so much alike. She'll probably have a backache this evening because she strains so much when I preach, okay? because she knows what I wrote down, and then she has to hear what I said. But it's being with somebody. We have to be with our Lord, no matter what. Him first. We're going to Him first. We're trusting on Him. We're putting our weight down on Him in everything we do. Pretty soon, somebody will say the words, what is it about that person? What is their attitude? What is it all about? They're a chip off the old block. The acorn didn't fall far from that tree. They are their father's son. I long to be part of a church which people we, with people that have met God and become God in the flesh. I think we got to start. Let's don't back up. Let's go forward. And with that understanding, when Christ wants to be us, when he is us, that means we're responsible for everything, everything we say, we do, and we think. What we put in our mouths to eat, what we think. Hey, I'll give you a clue. Did you know that there's some Democrats that are Christians? Did you know, Democrats, that there's some Republicans that are Christians too? Don't let this world start drawing big, heavy lines and us playing their game with them. We don't play that game. We belong to him. We are him in the flesh. We're reconciling anybody we can to him. 
to him. So I long to be a part of a church like that. This high view of the church is a needed antidote to many lesser views that permeate our ongoing idea of church today. We're not just another group that's meeting on the corner. No. For his people in this place for this time. Why am I here at this time? He knows. Because he wants you here at this time. We're the leaven. We're the light of the world. We're the city set on a hill that can't be hid. That's who we are. With a boss like that. Mm -hmm. And to become like him is the thing. His character and and priorities, his ministry and mission become fundamental for determining how we build Christ's church today and how he builds it through us. So I got something for a takeaway for you. Uh, my executive assistant helped me write this. Think of it being a royal priest. That's what we are too, right? Think of being a royal priest and being the voice and hands of Jesus in this world, who comes to mind when you think of that? Not, of not yourselves, but who do you picture? You got somebody that comes in mind. Today during lunch, why don't you just talk it over? Say, you know, when a preacher was preaching about Christ in the flesh and we are Christ. Somebody in your life has come along like that? Who, who is it? And what about them makes you think like that? Then discuss... What uh, what makes that person that way, okay? What makes them like that? Remember the two guys, they, the Sanhedrin pulls them in, and, and they understand that these, these are pretty unlearned fishermen, man. They're just kind of like good old boys. They can't figure out how they can come up with all the answers. They've been with who? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They've been with Jesus. That'll make the difference. That'll make the difference in everything we do as a church. That'll make a difference in everything we do with our lives. That'll make a difference in our children. Please, I heard another statistic. This happened in a classroom. The teacher usually had four or five uh, round tables where their kids met. And I don't know if they were high school or, or middle school or what. But all he asked them to do for the last 15 minutes of class was sit and talk to each other. Communicate. And what are the first thing they started to do after he said that? Whoop, out come the cell phone. Whoop, out come the iPad. And he says, no, no, no. You got to put away those things. Put them away. I want you to just talk with each other. I don't care what about. Just have a conversation. Some of them just put their head down on their desk because they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I got in more trouble for talking to my fellow students in high school because I have a voice where I can't whisper and I try to whisper and the teacher would say, Night, shut up. But parents, we have so much to say. We need to take that place again. But we're guiding the kids instead of the kids guiding us. It would really help to turn the next generation around into what the Lord wants, the incarnation of himself through us. Thank you. Let's pray. Overwhelmingly, Father, you're beyond all description and way beyond all of our understanding that you're everywhere, every place, all the time. It's just really hard to get a hold of. But Father, that you know, you know us, and you desire to live within us, and to let us represent you, is again another amazing, amazing fact. Thank you, Lord, and we continue to pray for that empowering even more. Help the world not to get a hold of our minds. Help us, help us not to be drugged down the same paths where the world just seems to run to destruction. Help us not become so routine in, in everything we do that we have no time to hear you. No time for quiet. No time to communicate with each other about you. Help us step back 
and then step up in your presence and accept the responsibility we have as being you in this place today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.